Good morning and welcome to our event today. We are sponsored by Intel this morning, but this is a Euractive hybrid event, so it's lovely to see people in the room, as well as so many of you joining us online from across Europe and around the world. Today's event, we are entitling it about semiconductors, a cornerstone for Europe's digital future. And when we think about that word cornerstone, it really is the foundation of everything we want to do, be it autonomous driving, being it remote medical services, everything that the digital future promises us is built on this one very fundamental element. Now, the EU has set forward an important ambition, a very ambitious ambition to produce around 20% of the world's cutting edge semiconductors by 2030. And that's a big leap. That's a 9% leap from where we are today. So we're going to talk this morning about how we get there. How do we achieve that? How to become this world leader? There is a current chip shortage around the world, which we're all very aware of. It's having knock on effects in supply chains everywhere. So this is an extremely timely debate. And I'm delighted to say that this morning, I have got a great panel of experts with me to discuss that. We are going to have a presentation on research. So Global Management Consultancy Kearney has produced a report sponsored by Intel on the future demand of these leading edge semiconductors. We're going to hear from them about what we can expect. It's a uh, cutting edge, very leading edge report. It was only just produced. Uh, you may not have had a chance to read it yet, but we're going to get into the detail of some of that. And of course, we will be sharing with you the links and where you can go and read more throughout this morning's discussion. As always, on your active events, we encourage interaction with you, the audience. So please do write down your questions to our speakers. Please try and be concise because we've uh, short of time, as always, but we will try to get as many as possible. So uh, just, just try and put those in there in the conversation and direct them to whichever speaker you want to answer them. If it's for the whole panel, please do indicate that as well. And I've got various devices here with me, all powered by semiconductors that I'm going to be using to try and keep on top of what you want to ask. Of course, we have people in the audience as well. Feel free to raise your hand in the old fashioned way and I will bring, um, bring in questions. Uh, if we can, you can use your tablets as well because I know that you all have those on you as well. With that, I'm going to hand over the floor to a, a, a welcome remark uh, from Greg Slater, who's the Vice President of Intel, to tell us a bit more about why this study was commissioned. And then we'll go straight into a presentation of the study itself. So over to you, Greg. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. And um, we our company's been in a semiconductor semiconductor industry for more than 50 years. We have a manufacturing presence in Ireland and a strong supply chain supply chain uh, in, on the continental Europe. Um, every government in the world is trying to figure out how to attract more of the supply chain to, to their jurisdiction. And the reasons are simple. The chip shortage, there's technology leadership reasons because semiconductors are the foundation, foundational blocks of all emerging technologies. And um, so we, we commissioned this report to inform policymakers on the value of leading edge semiconductor manufacturing. Again, we manufacture here in Europe, we wanna do more, and we think it's really uh, part of the critical ecosystem that we need here. And as you'll hear today, the manufacturing has spin-off benefits, has innovation benefits, and it, and it can strengthen the entire ecosystem. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Kearney. Gentlemen, you have the floor. Please introduce yourselves, present your report. We're actually here more than anything to listen to you. We first start with introducing ourselves. Go that ahead. might be a nice, would you agree, Jennifer? Uh, good morning. We are also very happy uh, to, uh, to be here. Um, my name is uh, Johan Aurik. I'm a partner and chairman emeritus of uh, AT Carney, and together with Guido and a large team of consultants had the pleasure in the last months uh, to uh, to study uh, this uh, this topic, this fascinating topic, and to uh, produce this uh, report. Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you, Johan. I'm a colleague of Johan uh, from the Munich office from Carney, and happy to be here and uh, walk you through a few of the highlights of the study. Um, for more details, please look uh, or t take a read in the study. I will just take a few snapshots and happy to pick up uh, in the discussion other facets of our study. 
So the study was conducted in the last months uh, uh, based upon uh, market reports, our uh, proprietary kind of knowledge, as well as also selected set of interviews. And I just quickly want to walk you through uh, key findings here. So as Jennifer mentioned, digitalization is everywhere in Europe. Uh, we see it, especially in the pandemic, pandemic, we have seen it, that we're using digital devices in every day's life. And uh, what we see also, if we look at Europe, and we maybe can show the first slide. Yes. So if, uh, if we look at the, um, uh, the consumption of semiconductors in Europe, so this means how semiconductors are being used in various applications, be it in telecommunication, be it in automotive, but be it also mobile phones, the consumption will double in the coming uh, 10 years. So there will be a healthy growth uh, and there will be more use of semiconductors. But I think which is more important is that if we look at the usage of these semiconductors in Europe, a certain segment of this uh, um, industry is growing at a much higher pace at 15% pace, and that's the so-called leading edge semiconductors. So semiconductors uh, which are, have very, very fine structures, so below 10 nanometers, and the main growth behind it will be topics like artificial intelligence, high performance computing, communication, 5G, 6G, but also other industries uh, which are not using it so much will pick up over the time. For instance, automotive, just one example is autonomous driving, uh, which will drive this. So there's a lot of usage of these chips in the coming years, and Europe depends upon it because it's not just that we uh, put these chips into our uh, products, but we also use them in a lot of critical applications, and if they wouldn't be there, these applications would not run. On the other hand, Jennifer already mentioned it. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, Jennifer mentioned that the capacity, for instance, in semiconductors uh, is went down and there's an ambition to increase it. If we look at the so-called leading edge semiconductor technology, so again, the small bar uh, in the first slide with the very, very small feature sizes, so below 10 nanometers, uh, here the capacity um, uh, changed over time from Europe, which had a good position uh, in the, uh, two, de two decades ago, to basically zero or a moderate position. And the forecast, and this is a steady state forecast, meaning we're projecting the current situation into the future, it will say zero in 2030 if we're not acting on the capacity side. So uh, what to do? So what we recommend is to strengthen the ecosystem of the leading edge semiconductor system. So Europe ha has already several strong pillars in, the, uh, in this ecosystem. For instance, we have great research here in Belgium with IMAC. We have great suppliers which have a leading position in selected segments. Uh, we also have quite a lot of talent. And here we say, first of all, we need to further broaden it and also strengthen the system. For instance, on the talent side, we, and we can see that in the study also, uh, we have a great foundation around senior graduates as, as well as PhD. We're leading here as a region in Europe. If we can more bring this also towards um, the semiconductor industry, that would be a great foundation and will create a lot of innovation. The two areas where we would say we would stronger build our foundation in Europe, that's first of all, design of leading edge semiconductors as well as also manufacturing of leading edge semiconductors. So having also manufacturing in Europe. And uh, if you look at other industries, where was Europe really strong when it combined design, engineering and manufacturing? And uh, an example which is quite current, just look at vaccines, uh, where we have a combination of both which brings a lot of advantages. And if we want to strengthen this, um, it's not just about um, um, building it up, it will create this innovation, so we're also at the forefront of the next cycle, but it will also create a lot of economic benefits. And just a snapshot here, maybe on the next page, please. If we would look at a 10-year horizon of a five nanometer megafab, this is a simulation, or it's, it's a model um, for foundry capacity. I know this is a very, it's a very high investment. We're talking about 17 to 18 billion euros to invest into it, but it will pay back uh, from a GDP perspective uh, with around about 80 billion over 10-year horizon, as well as also the employment. We have around about 3,000 people in the fab, but there's a lot of uh, effects within the value chain and also the ecosystem. So there's benefits coming from the these investments if we would strengthen the ecosystem of leading edge semiconductors. On the other hand side, we have to really also see all parameters which are needed to be successful here in Europe. I mentioned one topic is talent. Uh, there are other things like a very good infrastructure, um, 
typical topics you uh, look at if you're making a decision uh, where, to, um, uh, where to locate yourself uh, globally. But there's also one topic is the cost structure. And we modeled here for a, um, a five nanometer uh, fab the different cost structures uh, between regions, for instance, uh, in Europe as well as also um, East Asia. The next slide, please. Uh, the, the different cost structures. Um, and you see there are cost differences if you look at the capex as well as also the opex um, of um, a fab of this 10 years. It's a, it's a hypothetical fab. It's something which is modeled for this uh, typical uh, node here. And there's a difference in incentives. So how much uh, governments are incentivizing um, companies going um, into the region as well as into the industry. And to have a level playing ground again, we also need to consider here as Europe how to react uh, so uh, to, to to also attract key companies um, um, coming to Europe. And now, how to do it? Um, as you know, uh, if we maybe go uh, one step back, there are three companies currently in the world, uh, TSMC, Samsung, and Intel, who have the capability of leading edge technology. Uh, if Europe would do it by itself, we believe that it would take longer uh, would even need more investments as well as also associated with certain risks. So we also say uh, if we uh, strengthen the system, we have to partner globally, which is any way given in this industry um, to also then make it happen uh, on the manufacturing side, but also on the design side. So we recommend here, first of all, to strengthen the ecosystem, um, to, to develop these pillars in Europe, but also to partner uh, with uh, strategic partners here as Europe. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, you skipped through so many slides there, so I know there is a depth behind what you've just presented that is goes a lot more into the, the nitty-gritty of what we're talking about. But I'm going to introduce our panel because I do want to get your initial reactions to what you've just heard. I know you've had a brief chance to perhaps read some of the detail, but uh, there's a lot more to delve into. I think it would be uh, unreasonable to expect everyone to have found the depth of this study within just a few minutes. So let me introduce you. We have joining us online, we have Sigrid Johansen, who's a special advisor for economic resilience in the Dutch government. Sigrid, lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us. Joda Book is the executive vice president and chief strategy officer at IMEC, one of the leading organizations that we, we heard them mentioned here, but based here in Belgium. Joining us also online and Lise Feur is the Director General of Etno so needs no introduction in the Brussels area. Uh, uh, Greg you are also staying with us you're going to give us some thoughts. Sigrid let me start with you um, you heard this um, overview of the study give me your initial reactions to, to what you've heard surprised or, or more that you've had your ideas confirmed I'm really interested to hear. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for, for having me on the panel. Um, it's a very interesting report and a very good report, I think, uh, as well. Uh, it goes in depth in, in many of the issues which are relevant eh, on, on, on this matter. Do we want uh, to make this big step uh, towards leading edge semiconductor design, engineering, uh, manufacturing, and maybe also application? I'll come to that later. Um, it's an important moment, but it's it's not new. Uh, in 2007, when I was manager of high tech systems uh, and talked to a lot of companies and governments in Europe, this was one of the topics as well. Um, at that time, I think uh, it would have cost us 10 billion, uh, which is a considerable different amount than at the present time. Uh, I met the topic again in 2014 uh, in the Commission when we discussed uh, the Airbus of chips. And uh, now again, and it's a new momentum, I think, um, uh, considering the geopolitical tensions uh, that, that makes us rethink our value chains, our, uh, the importance of chips, our dependency, the vulnerability, but also makes us look at the future, uh, the future of Europe, I think. And that's it's very important also considering our strength in this area. Um, it's, the chip shortage is also, uh, was mentioned before, um, a very important topic uh, to rethink our future, uh, to rethink our semiconductor ecosystem. Um, and I think we also see an exponential growth 
uh, of the semiconductor industry. And there are lots of new opportunities lying ahead. And how will Europe uh, capture this moment? Um, I also think it's important if we talk about chip shortage to really look what the causes are. Because sometimes I see uh, that things are being combined um, and we draw conclusions and maybe we do not always have the right problem analysis. Um, uh, the causes can be from, from snowstorms in Texas to fires in Japan to COVID uh, to unilateral measures uh, by governments. And so it's a whole yeah, framework of different causes and that we should look at about which chips uh, does this concern and how can we resolve this. I think we should also look at the broader sector um, have, when you talk about leading edge, uh, and if we see what are the European strengths, uh, we have several things that I think uh, make Europe quite unique. Uh, um, I see you the book, uh, so I think of IMEC as uh, a world leading research uh, institute in this area. And we, of course, have ASML, which is a very, very important company uh, globally. Uh, we also see uh, that Europe has a strong uh, semiconductor sector, uh, which also has its challenges, but uh, it's part of our ecosystem, so we should incorporate this in our vision. Uh, and what I'm trying to say that um, although the report focuses uh, on a certain sector and also addresses the broader picture, if we develop in Europe our new vision on the future of Semicom, we should do it from a holistic uh, approach. Uh, so not maybe only combined design, engineering, manufacturing, but especially also uh, the application side, because where will the market be? Um, yeah, I think it was also mentioned in the report um, that building uh, such a facility in Europe might be 30 to 50 percent uh, more expensive than elsewhere, which will translate itself in the costs of chips. Yeah? So how can you stay competitive? And having your own market in this uh, sector is, is extremely important. Um, if I look at Asia, um, yeah, where there is I think a, a growing, increasingly growing market also in the US and because it's a data driven industry. Uh, Europe has, let's say, has still to grasp this opportunity of becoming more data driven. And from that point of view, you'll also get more of a, yeah, a market in which this capacity will land. Um, from a government point of view, um, of course, we have the, the concern uh, that of uh, yeah, ending up in a subsidy war. Uh, no one will benefit from this. Uh, so how can we keep the level playing field and at the same time promote innovation and competition? Uh, so it's a, it's a balance. Um, uh, from the Dutch government, we're trying to take all these different aspects into account. Um, yeah, and my main message is that the whole ecosystem, the whole semicon ecosystem is important. And it should be part of the decision, should be part of the future uh, of Europe. I'd like to leave it at that. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sigrid. And uh, I too remember the Airbus of Chips slogan, which was perhaps laudable in ambition, but uh, a little bit of a, a hot air slogan rather than something that actually delivered. Uh, Yo and the book, you've been name checked several times already this morning. We're really keen to get your reaction to the uh, brief report um, on the study, but also, you know, the, the detail of the study itself. Thank you very much. And again, uh, thanks for, for being um, invited on this panel. Uh, interesting references being made. So IMIC indeed is, is part of this ecosystem and proud to be uh, part of this ecosystem. Um, a few things in the report do resonate. And of course, it, it as you said, requires deeper study. But there are a few things that clearly also speak to our to our DNA. And I'd like to just mention them here. Um, and that's and it's been mentioned a few times is the, the ecosystem. This is about, first of all, global partnership, but also um, being locally present in an ecosystem. It's an ambition that we've had as, uh, as IMEC since the, our very, very beginning, 38 uh, years ago um, about. And then 
Europe's present uh, presence in that digital future in in that ecosystem, I think, is the key ambition to which we are, are speaking here. So, shorter term, medium term, but specifically long term, there's going to be the need for advanced uh, semiconductors, and that is actually very well represented in the study here as well, where you see this uh, curve of the the growth in the coming decade and decades to come. And not just because of the, the sheer need of compute, because uh, of the applications uh, requiring it. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So I think in, in ecosystem and ecosystem innovation, uh, Europe does have um, players, you know, we as IMIC, but also other RTOs. And I think the, the European industry as general has played uh, very well uh, in, in this ecosystem globally. We believe that, um, and then I want to come to to an important element in the ecosystem is the connection in in between the different partners. Uh, you can call it supply chain, but it's also an innovation chain, is, if you want. So uh, we, we strongly believe in connecting to, for instance, the suppliers, and ASML was mentioned by Sigrid for very, very good reasons, evidently. IMEC has had a, well, 30 plus year um, experience and, and relationship in, in how to try to provide value to players like ASML, but others as well, and, and making sure that the suppliers find a hub to, to, to innovate and to innovate in an, in, at an industrial scale. So when we say research, we really see it through the eyes of the industry. And that is, I think, a very important element, uh, complementing the breakthrough innovation that you'd also need, but making sure it becomes an, uh, a real innovation in the market. So suppliers are important for Europe, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's wise to mention them here. Um, they're mentioned in the report. Um, I grant that, but I, I think it's important to really address it once more. And then, of course, it's important to also have, and we mentioned skills, and, and skills is one thing, but skills bring knowledge and, and they sort of, uh, you know, am amplify knowledge when, when you can, uh, can bring them to bear. Skills is very important. It brings European IP in those elements of the, uh, of the future, the digital future that, uh, that will require European presence. So I think Europe has done well, and again, also that is mentioned in the study, done well in, in the R&D and bringing that research to bear. Uh, it's now time to make sure that we harvest on that also in Europe. And, and that's something that you can only do when you continue to invest in that uh, in that bridging between the breakthrough and the market needs. And that brings me to the, to the third part where I think ecosystems are important. And again, it's going to be a bit repetitive, I'm sure Sigrid mentioned it uh, already. It is understanding where the chips go into. Of course, we can say it's compute and we have had happy scaling decades uh, in the past. Where we know, you know, whatever we may we, we we did to make the transistor smaller, there's going to be use for this, and this is going to continue to continuously be true, of course, because you save a lot of energy when you go to the smaller nodes. You can do a lot of more functionality in smaller places, but also you will combine this with applications in the digital arena that are um, demanded by and needed for the applications that are very important for Europe or globally speaking, even. And so that connection is, is very important. And I do applaud the study uh, um, really doubling down on that uh, combination of the application, mentioning a couple of, of very important markets, as was mentioned already in the opening statements, of course, automotive, health, but also you know the digital future of our energy system, et cetera. All of that will need a combination of not just the leading edge nodes, but also advanced functionality leading to that. And then finally, I want to, I'm sure we'll come back to some of these elements in, in the ecosystem, um, but, but uh, I think we strongly believe, and I want to just emphasize that point again, in, in a global partnership. I mean, there's no such thing as having um, an, an, a full ecosystem on an island. This is going to be, uh, or a continent for that matter, it's going to be a global partnership. And, and uh, let's find ways to, to connect to our partners um, transatlantic within Europe, um, places that we find are in the same spirit of making the digital future uh, a global arena. So I'd like to end here for now and, and be more than happy to come back on, on other comments. Thank you very much. And indeed, I am sure there will be plenty of questions for you. A reminder to our audience to put those in the discussion on the chat. Um, and here in the room, you've all got phones. By all means, please put your questions to us as well. Lise, it's lovely to see you back in person again. It feels like it's been a long time. Give me the Etno perspective and explain why Etno is so involved in this and, and your reaction to the study. 
Well, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you for inviting uh, Etno to, to this panel. Uh, Etno uh, represents the leading telcos in, in Europe, so that uh, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, etc. But we also have uh, observers from the value chain like Nokia, uh, Ericsson, and also Qualcomm. So I will bring the telecom uh, viewpoint, and, and I have three key messages for today. I had very a short time to re read the report, but I think it's very timely and, and useful and much needed. So uh, first point, uh, from a telecom uh, perspective, our industry is an important part of the semiconductor uh, industry too. We have technological developments like uh, cloud computing, Internet of Things, uh, 5G and, and 6G is increasingly, also as mentioned in the report, uh, demanding uh, high performance computing. Uh, also ubiquitous broad broadband communication all is, is needing semiconductors. And also recently my colleagues in the US Association, US Telecom, they have published a report on semiconductors showing that the pandemic uh, with uh, remote working, remote education was a major drive of, of uh, further uh, semiconductor demand also in the US. So there is a demand all over the world. Uh, our second point is that the issue described in the Kearney report is similar to the one that we uh, very well know in the telecom sector, because with semiconductors, uh, Europe faces a great opportunity, as also mentioned in the report. Uh, we have a growth market, we have a strategic one, we have the skills, and it has a societal and also economic uh, benefit. Um, but this is also what happens to the new generation of connectivity seen from a telco side. So I believe the big question here for Europe is how do we keep that value that we create and how do we keep it in Europe and how do we make it useful for the European uh, economy? And there, I think the investments of Intel in Europe are much needed, and this should be good news for, for the capitals. Uh, a third and last point, uh, also on the side of the solutions, I see similarities with what is happening in, in 5G, but also in digital services in the telecom sector, because we believe that industrial policy is the best tool to, to work, to tackle these historical challenges that we're uh, facing right now uh, in the transition to new telecom networks, but also to stronger Europe in semiconductor uh, industry. So I do welcome the work that the European Commission is doing on this, especially with uh, Commissioner Breton, but talking about industrial policy, first and foremost, we need to allow and encourage collaboration among industrial players in those areas where it's necessary to build global leadership. So that's uh, important. And also, of course, scale. Uh, second, industrial policy also means that we need a strong public and private collaboration, as pointed out in the report. And there, I think we need to have uh, policymakers see themselves as not only regulators, but facilitators. And the facilitator element is, is key here. Uh, finally, uh, industrial policy means to take an ecosystem view. I think all of us have mentioned it so far. Uh, and this is essential both for industrial leadership and from an innovation angle. So we need to look at the full value chain uh, to innovate and involve all actors. Thank you very much, Lise. I knew you said, I welcome what the Commission is doing. I knew there was going to be a but <laughs> when it comes into that. Um, but thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, Young Guid, I don't know which of you wants to respond to it, but the, the, our three speakers have, have pretty much I sort of agreed with a lot of what you found, but they're suggesting different solutions to, for example, the current problem and projecting a future. Um, how do you see the future panning out? Would you like to? Well, uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, for the previous speakers. Uh, everyone strongly made the point that you have to take an ecosystem point of view, and, and we couldn't agree more. The ecosystem is global, is highly complex. Uh, it is absolutely true that Europe is, is, has many areas of strength, so uh, it's absolutely feasible 
uh, we believe, for Europe to catch up. And I believe Siegfried mentioned, compared to 2007, I think you mentioned as the date, um, you, you are absolutely right. Um, a lot of these trends were already noted uh, several years ago. But what has happened in the meantime, um, uh, particularly in, in design and manufacturing for leading edge, Europe has, we also need to recognize that, not done enough. Uh, so there, there are gaps there. We believe that gap can be bridged. Uh, and we point out in the report uh, to ways to do that. But there's one word that I would like to underline, uh, and that you see that in the title of the report, that is the word urgent. Um, uh, it takes years after approval, three, four, five years, to build uh, a leading edge manufacturing uh, facility, a megafab, uh, so to speak. Um, the clock is ticking. <laughs> um, we cannot uh, afford another 10 years of debate and of um, uh, nice words. Uh, it is really important that both governments uh, and industry combined, and not only European industry but global industry, partners do, uh, that actions uh, is taken and that, uh, uh, and that uh, investments are being made. Otherwise, we will be sitting here in 10 years from now having the same debate, and that would really be a shame. Well, thank you. I see um, we actually already have one or two questions coming in from our audience. I'm going to let those build up before I come to them. But um, Sigrid, um, I'm going to ask you all for a little bit of a doomsday scenario. What is the worst case scenario? Um, we, we, we heard the word urgency here, and this is not new, Sigrid, as you pointed out. We've been talking about a supposed Airbus for ships for a long, long time. What's the worst case scenario if there is a failure to act? Um, well, you can develop many worst case scenarios uh, uh, who can eventually end up in Hollywood uh, in Hollywood films. Um, I would, yeah, that's more me to, to think of the opportunity. Um, uh, as I mentioned, it is a, an important momentum to make the right decision. Uh, also in the book, in the report, it was mentioned uh, two things. Like in, it was, I think, Philips who started TSMC as one of the founders with Taiwanese subsidies. Then I think, hmm, what a momentum was that. Uh, and it was also Philips that had 80% of the global uh, chips market uh, for smartphones. Uh, then you see um, the, the history of technology passing. And you think, which momentum should we take now? Uh, but consider it carefully, uh, not jump into a, a big adventure, uh, but really look, uh, and I think all my colleagues in the panel have emphasized that, uh, what are the strengths of our ecosystem? Um, and what do we need additional? Uh, how it would also reflect on the growing economy uh, of Europe? Um, and that's a very important topic, uh, that as many as possible people benefit from this. Um, yeah, that can mean in, in, in healthcare applications or other applications, it can mean in jobs, it can mean in, in better education. And so how will this translate into society and economy? And from, let's say, also a more geopolitical point of view, if you can manage a stable situation in this sector uh, where there is trust in the future, uh, where there is clarity, uh, I think uh, that will be tremendously important. Uh, also work with partners and allies, uh, but also work with all the other countries uh, to whom Semicon uh, is important. Um, so you can discuss this from many different angles, geopolitically, economically, societal. Uh, it's an important momentum, but take the broad picture uh, and uh, emphasize what is so good about the European ecosystem. What do you need uh, additionally, uh, and where will the benefits land? Yo, yo, the same question to you. Um, I'm, I know we want to try and focus on the opportunities and the positives, but as we start this discussion, let's look at what the downside could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. So it's a moral duty to be optimist in a, in a technology sector like this, but indeed there is... There is a, a, a real doomsday, I think, that can happen is that you lose your strengths, right? I mean, I think, and we've uh, we've heard a few examples of that in, in uh, where we where we might have had an historic opportunity or were on top of it and, and lost it. I think um, one of the worst things to happen is that you lose current strengths that you have. 
and that then immediately turn this positive, um, the, the opportunity there is to build on them, right? So Europe does have strengths. It, it is mentioned in the in the program um, or in the, in the report. Um, building on those strengths is, is the first thing to do. And that's where typically also the, the, the most easy investments are. The, the return on investments are clear. Um, but it also means we have to be very vigilant, right? One of the strengths of automotive industry, well, the way a car is built is, has changed. The car builders are different today in a sense that who is bringing the, the future car to market is, is a game that's really fully open. And so I think strengths there are important. And it's mentioned that, you know, we do have the, the, the know-how of building of building uh, these complex systems in Europe, like cars, is is uh, is of course one of those, and and that is a strength. And if you connect that then to where the digital future in those applications is, um, you you can build a you know a plan towards these these very advanced uh, manufacturing also in Europe. And I think that's where the, the scenario. And I'm leaving out the doomsday part here. I mean, the scenario is to be that we building on those strengths, continuing to to double down on that because there is a market for those strengths today um, and then stepping um, and then leaping i would say stepping is maybe too uh, too passive leaping to that uh, to that digital future with and building on the momentum that there is with you know serious investments indeed so we, we saw the curve of of um, of incentives we or the graphs of incentives um, that's one player there is legislation maybe that can come in there is uh, for sure also the attractiveness of europe that needs to be amplified outside, so that we can we can get talent in, we can get VC money in, because I think uh, startups and ventures are a very important element in in um, in getting to that uh, leapfrogging scenario, and then um, building you know a technology and innovation leadership uh, in this. And I, I was happy to hear that in the EU Chips Act uh, pre-announcement that there was a a clear statement on technology and innovation leadership ambition and a program to support that. So I think stepping away from the doomsday scenario into a future scenario, those are a few elements I think which are really critical success factors that we have in hand. And so in that sense, a bit of an historic uh, debate. Well, thank you very much. Lise, no surprise, same, same question to you. Um, the, the obvious one is, of course, uh, uh, the risk of losing digital leadership. But from a telco uh, point of view, I think what will be important uh, for us in the future is a lot about uh, the uh, edge computing, the edge cloud, and uh, not having the the innovation hubs, the spin-off ecosystems here in Europe risk uh, slowing that process down for the telco. So I think for us, it's important we have an, an industry, uh, uh, an ecosystem in Europe that is innovative uh, because we're looking into a future where we would like to move. We have 5G, we have 6G. Edge cloud will be uh, extremely important, and if we can build that in to ecosystems with the semiconductor industries, I think that would be extremely important. Let me add you into this conversation now as well, with the same question. I mean, we, we've heard different perspectives of everyone trying to be optimistic, but I will start with being a little bit pessimistic. We are in a current chip shortage, and this is something that was not necessarily foreseen by the wider uh, ecosystem. Did you see this potentially being an issue? And, and what is the worst case scenario if it's not addressed? Well, so whether it's geopolitical concerns or natural disasters, if you don't have manufacturing, then you're reliant on a supply that comes from a very small part of the world. And if you can't get that supply, we've already seen what's happened in the auto industry, but the shortage is much broader than that. So there's that issue. There's the ability to, to supply your industries with fundamental semiconductors that run telcos, that run, run the digital economy. But there's also the, the technology leadership aspect. <clears throat> and as the Kearney report points out, the two, value, the two areas that have the most value add are design and manufacturing. And when you lose one, you impair the other. If you have both, they create synergistic effects. And so in terms of technology leadership, you, you also want the most critical parts of the supply chain 
here on the continent. You can't have the whole supply chain necessarily in a very robust manner, but you can pick the most critical elements for, for technology leadership. Well, I think that's that's become quite quite clear because of the, the current pandemic. It, we are buzzword, if you like, in Brussels used to be sustainability and now it's resilience. And that's about supply chain resilience. So let me ask, we, we've talked about various different sorts of shortages. And I hear all of you speakers saying it's the geopolitical situation. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, yo, I'm going to come to you and ask you to drill down into that a little bit and, and be clear about what we mean by that and what Europe can actually do to offset these sorts of concerns issues. I'm going to stay on the the place I know best, which is technology. So um, I'm not going to make any uh, political statements in this uh, particular regard. So um, one thing I can say from, from at least our, our history is that that uh, geopolitics hasn't played as much as it plays today, which is a, 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 you know, a very uh, easy statement to make. Um, we've always seen that uh, global partnerships have uh, flourished. We have uh, uh, in, uh, partly enabled that, we believe. We, we have also seen um, success factors coming our way when we do this. And um, I think that the mistakes we shouldn't make is indeed to to, to let the, the very important elements of that global partnership drift apart too far. And what I mean by that is, and, and I refer to what Greg just said, is that the, the, the high value elements which are in that ecosystem, you always need to have um, either control or, or access to, which is... Uh, whatever you know is, is easiest to get or a very strong partnership and what i mean to say is if you're too distant from advanced technology and you may still have the design you may not have the real connect to the future uh, if that distance is, is too big and um let me let me clarify that if if uh, if you want to create a demand and you know that the the demand is is or the applications that will create the demand are in need of, of a digital functionality but you're a bit too far out on, on, on knowing what exactly can be done, how the new technology will influence your application, how you will maybe um, be Sean Peter if somebody else comes by and, and understood before you did what that new technology can offer, then, then you're lost. And I think a very important element, um, and that's why you know geopolitics should be... Um, dealt with, I think, is to make sure that, that partners in the geopolitical scene understand that it's important for all of us to have a good connect between the high value add elements of the of the ecosystem. And so therefore we, we truly believe and we see it happen all the time in our in our global partnership as we have it here, is that companies that stepped away from, from the manufacturing side are eager to find out what is going to come next. And of course they then need also, when they understand what's coming next, they need they will need access to manufacturing. But first, you'll need access to the insights, to the exploration, to to validate and demonstrate in in, in sort of pilot uh, facilities or or you know access to early um, demonstrations of technology um, to to explore that and to understand what it would mean for your own products or services, but also for that of your customers and the customers of your customers. So that is that is very clearly, I think, um, the, the key element in in on on which the the partnership discussion should focus. The high value add elements in the ecosystem. Do we jointly have a good view on how we partake in those and and how we share them, and how we can actually build a, a level playing field on on that? If that's not clear, I'm I'm willing to amplify it, but I think that's a very important element. Well. I'm going to come to Sigrid, and, and obviously uh, you're in a different position than you um, uh, and our other panellists. Um, I'm not asking you to make a political statement, but do tell me a bit more about where you see this geopolitical problem and where the nexus of that is. Um, I think what we all see is that uh, from yeah, a very successful globalism uh, what, do, what do you call it? If you look at the success of the present uh, semiconductor industry, um, a large part of that success is globalism. And the ability to look everywhere for the best conditions, the best partners, and the best 
uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, and that has developed uh, a very sensitive system and a very broad spread globally um, of the value chain. Uh, the longer the value chain is and the more spread it is, it also makes us vulnerable for all sorts of possible events or actions. Uh, and in a, at a time where we all know um, that technology is being used more and more uh, as an instrument, um, by can be done by, by countries or by um, other people who don't mean too well. Uh, so it, decreasing this vulnerability in such a sensitive supply chain for us, uh, I think, is something to be uh, considered. Um, at the same time, we have very strong partners globally. And I, if I look at uh, what Jo of IMEX said, uh, these partnerships should be strengthened uh, to see where we can work together, uh, where we can maintain and build on this leadership. Uh, how can we decrease the vulnerabilities, um, but also make sure you create a stable situation. I think uh, over the last four years, uh, so many yeah, actions have been taken um, that I think the sector should be uh, yeah, more be able to, to rely on what policy actions are. Yeah? And not so much unilateral, but preferably uh, if we want to do something, agree multilateral on, uh, on certain actions. Uh, tech leadership is important. Uh, and we're talking a lot here about uh, advanced uh, semicon. Um, we should also take into account how important uh, the mature semicon sector is. Yeah, if it's about uh, chip shortages, um, at the moment it's mainly um, also looking at Infineon, NXP, ST Microelectronics, and others, and Bosch. Um, they are very important for our European ecosystem as well. Yeah, so we have to do both, uh, look at our mature ecosystem and look at the advanced ecosystem and also where they can uh, join forces and become stronger together. Uh, it's not one or the other, I think it's and, and. Um, I also think that by creating these, these global partnerships um, and creating a more interdependency, uh, you also are more aware of each other's position and the, the need uh, that you need each other. And I think what you want to avoid, if every continent has its own value chain, that in the end you become each other's competitors and then you end up in uh, the, the, the well-known subsidy wars, etc. So where can you work together, build uh, trust, uh, build this leadership together, uh, but also taking into account the importance uh, of our mature industry, uh, which is now investing a lot in Europe. Uh, if I look at the recent investments by Bosch, by Infineon, uh, I hope there's going to be more. Uh, if Intel is, is interested in investing in, in Europe, uh, I'm sure we welcome that. Uh, so, um, geopolitically, a lot of things are happening. Uh, building on our own strength, and I can only repeat that, uh, and taking the whole ecosystem into account is very important. Thank you, Sigrid. I'm, I'm struck by what you say is there's this competitive nature and, and the need to collaborate in so many events, not just in the tech sector we talk about. Is Europe leading? Europe must do better than Asia and America and the global south. Um, that does create this rather competitive uh, background to these events. Lise, how do you view it? I see you taking a lot of notes there. You're nodding away with a lot of what uh, uh, what Sigrid was saying. No, but uh, uh, Sigrid was talking about the, the value chain and the longer it gets, the more vulnerable it gets. And I, I completely agree on this, but I also see there is a need not, uh, to have a longer value chain. We see that we need to work much more uh, uh, with the different uh, parties in the value chain, both with our uh, vendors, but also with the end users. So I, I think the value chain by design right now is growing uh, and we cannot stop that. So, so for me, it's important we look into a strong Europe that of course has an ecosystem that can help us uh, create and innovate and, and be resilient but we still need the global partnerships here. Uh, so I think we cannot turn time back and say we're not global, 
but we need to be smart in how we do our partnerships, but and also to realize that the value chain has changed. So it's not uh, black and white. It's much more collaboration than it was uh, five, ten years ago. Gentlemen, uh, I'm, I'm putting joint questions to you, Jan and Greta, because I'm interested to know, what does the report, what does your study have to say about this? Go ahead. So I think uh, I can now re-emphasize a lot of things which uh, the panelists <coughs> said here. So uh, we're also uh, advocating strongly to strengthen the ecosystem, also always having a global view here and also partnering. Um, but also somewhere take the advantages, um, as also a few of the colleagues mentioned, is in the moment where you are uh, close and combine things, a lot of innovation comes out. And I just want to somewhere re-emphasize now, independent of semiconductors, uh, Europe was always good when it's somewhere combined manufacturing and engineering. We see that in a lot of industries. So it doesn't mean that, and these industries are also partnering globally. Nevertheless, I think they have also kind of a strong, at least, foundation here in Europe. And that's something, uh, and I don't want to now re re reiterate these thoughts, but I would agree with those thoughts. Craig, I have a question coming in uh, from an audience from Julian Deutsch asking for specifically you to answer. Um, the EU is pushing for more semiconductor production in Europe, but is the EU investing too little money? And is the EU's CHIPS Act coming too late? Well, on a... It's a rather leading question yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from a journalist, on, on so a of course. <laughs> on a second question, it depends on how fast they, they implement the EU CHIPS Act. And they can learn from the US CHIPS Act and how that's going, the challenges that, that, that has faced. Is the EU investing too little? Well, I, the EU could always invest more. Um, it hasn't really invested yet in leading edge semiconductors. So um, it has pl plans to do that, it has a goal, a stretch, the 20% as you mentioned is a stretch goal, it's a good goal. Um, the US has a goal also, of, you know, and, um, and both need advanced semiconductor manufacturing. So I think, um, I think as Kearney mentioned, you know, the clock is ticking, it takes three to five years to get a fab up and running, and so, in that sense, you can't delay a whole lot longer because that share that they showed, that share of manufacturing will continue to decrease over time. And then at some point, it becomes harder to reverse, right? So now is the time to reverse it. I have a couple of questions here on partnerships. Uh, ben Bosman is wondering whether the speakers think that geopolitics and politicians in general are creating obstacles. I'm sure we all would say that's, that's the case of what they do, but uh, in the way of ensuring the smooth delivery of semiconductors or more generally technology, should there be a more technocratic approach towards partnerships. Um, Julian Gray also asked earlier, um, specifically to you, Yo, um, you had mentioned the nature of the ecosystem and the importance of global partnerships. And the, he's, he's asking you to comment on how geopolitics might shape these partnerships, particularly with regard to China, which is also prioritizing and building up its own leading edge semiconductors through subsidies. Yo, I'm going to ask you to comment, just, I mean, we, as I say, several questions, we can't deal with all of them in one go, but Talk to me about partnerships and about, for example, even public-private partnerships and the nature of how those work. Okay. Um, it, it's, do you have an hour? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think it, it's, it's very, a very involved uh, topic indeed. And so partnership in general, um, and I heard the word technocratic uh, in, in you know, bringing that in, in the different uh, discussions is, I think, uh, from our point of view, very important. So you need to talk about technology in, in a sense, but partnerships go way beyond that. And uh, maybe I want to expand just a little on, or, or um, you know, step back even. We we talk about the ecosystem of the semiconductors, which of course is very important and foremost our, our discussion item. But then again, let's think about partnerships between the telco and the automotive, right? I mean, there's not going to be a car that's not connected. There's not going to be um, anything happening basically in the industry which is not going to be connected maybe throughout the global chain uh, of, of, of certain concern. Um, so all of these applications, actually, all of these markets are going to be connected. Health is not disconnected from, from telecom again, it's not disconnected from, from your work and life and, and all of the data that you pick up there. Um, and I mentioned, it, I saw in the report pharmacy or you know, ph pharmaceutical companies were even mentioned. I was like, what is the connect? Well, you know, they built on HPC, they built on understanding their future molecules, they built on 
understanding how to make, for instance, cell therapies become more efficient through nanotechnology and through the, the most advanced semiconductor uh, behind that. So I think that is one thing to look at, at partnership to not focus only, though important, not, not only on the technology per se, but, but first of all, make sure that we globally understand, and of course, then also in Europe, where we can make a difference between, uh, by, uh, better said, by connecting the, the applications together. So I think that's where Europe has been traditionally strong, but that's also where, 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 where other continents are really building up, not only the manufacturing of chips per se, but understanding where that uh, that connect of the applications go to. And then, and sorry, that, I think that was an important thing to be a bit outside, maybe tangential to the discussion, but uh, coming back to, to the question how public-private partnerships can help, well, I think if we can we can point to the US and see the, the importance of, of procurement and and, uh, and very strong leadership in in uh, you know in in fueling the, the R and D and and fueling the uh, the prototyping uh, what it led to uh, you know for what we currently hold in our hands in terms of, of communication a lot of that has of course been fueled by by government uh, programs so that is true for of course Europe as well we have strong programs in in connecting. Um, uh, players in the in the innovation uh, system. We have, uh, in, in our particular context, Excel, transforming in KDT, key digital technologies, important. But then again, on top of that, you need to have that infrastructure on which it can land. And I think that's where public-private partnerships, um, and I, I truly believe the CHIPS Act now is bringing that momentum where we can build pan-European uh, collaboration to, to connect not only the technologies, but also those applications, as I earlier mentioned, on those platforms. That's where I, I believe um, these partnerships could, you know, could be pre-competitive, uh, which is one of the key words that we hold uh, very sacred here in our place. You know, we, we want to make sure that companies that maybe fiercely fight for the market out there see the hurdles and, and we tackle them together as, as much as we can. And lithography is one of those key examples of, of where we all benefit from making the solutions happen. So that is, I think, uh, an important element of uh, sort of pan-European investment in, in bringing the innovation through pilots, uh, through demonstration, through uh, you know, leadership uh, investments into, into the market quickly. I hope this only remotely answers part of that question. <laughs> no <classic>. problem. <laughs> Thank you, Yo. Liz, I want to get your perspective on public-private partnerships. We represent a lot of different private companies, but they often work with governments hand in glove. Let me just say, I agree with you that uh, connectivity is, is the foundation of much of what we're talking about here in, in Europe. So connected cars, uh, health, etc., and 5G and 6G is going to actually, uh, in, in my opinion, revolutionize how we, we live as, as uh, citizens in, in Europe. But, and, and partnerships, we have seen uh, partnerships on, for example, the connected cars. The commission pushed us. We are now strongly collaborating with the car industry on this. And I think it's extremely important we have this overall broad EU level uh, partnerships. But I also see a lot of partnerships out in the member states between uh, the operators and uh, much more the industries, not as much the uh, public-private uh, partnership, but more private-private partnerships and thinking how can we uh, elevate Europe into the next <laughs> generation on connectivity. And, and my point here is I think the Commission would benefit from moving away of thinking in silos it's very much did you connect or uh, it's where everything is happening instead it needs to be uh, unfolded into a, a broader more uh, horizontal uh, collaboration so i would pledge for us to to go into a new world where we take the whole value chain also when we talk about semiconductors because we see the uh, effects of if we have a shortage that's going to harm all of us all industries everything uh, all the citizens so we need to see this as a horizontal issue and not only as a digital issue well i'm you, you've picked up on a lot of questions that are coming in from our audience quite rapidly um greg i mean we, we've got a, a question here on, uh, from Antonio. would like to hear some thoughts from the panel on how the EU can 
in practice, balance between autonomy and cooperation on semiconductors. I think we've addressed a lot of that. But in terms of public-private partnerships across borders, so inside and outside the EU, how do you see that working? Well, a, a good example of that would be IMEC partnering with the National Semiconductor Technology Center that the Ch U.S. CHIPS Act is setting up. Rather than being competitors, they would find a way to partner together to raise, to as, as um, has been said, to get into the next level of technology and to move things forward. Um, so this c the, the TCC is another example um, of the p possibility of partnering on the supply chain security. Um, so, so there are multiple opportunities. I think um, I think that the need to see everything horizontally and not in silos, and where are the gaps, and where can allies and natural partners collaborate to fill those gaps? Nobody can do this alone. It's too complex. Um, but on the other hand, you do need a certain amount of autonomy in the key areas because of the geopolitical concerns, because of the concentration of manufacturing and so forth. So you have, as you say, you have to, well, how do you achieve that balance? It's, it is tricky and uh, we're trying to figure it out as well, but that's why we're here in Europe, right? We, that's why we want to invest more in Europe and leverage the, the strengths that are here and combine them with our strengths. Sigrid, I have a question for you uh, from uh, Christophe. It's, uh, it's very specific, it's asking, where do you see potential applications for advanced chips in European industry? Um, I'm sure half the panel here would say everywhere, but uh, I'd like to hear your response. <laughs> um, well, when, when, when Jo was explaining um, how the, the public-private partnerships, I remember that I once visited IMEC, um, and uh, the researchers there explained all these possibilities from, from healthcare uh, to cybersecurity to automotive. And then you come out of the building, you step in back into the forest and you think, wow, is this all possible? Uh, um, I think because of uh, semiconductors, but also because we are more and more advanced uh, on things like AI and how to work with data, uh, we have endless opportunities. Um, and I think if there's one challenge within Europe to use this excellent research base that we have, to use the flagships, uh, to use the, the different uh, IPCAI projects. Um, if the world needs to be more connected, um, if the European Commission even needs to be more connected, uh, then it's definitely that industry uh, should be maybe even more aware and in, especially in Europe, also be willing to take more risks. Um, I spent five, five years in the US, uh, saw the most interesting applications and people there to have the opportunity and the possibility to fail. Um, but thinking of broader concepts, thinking of bigger opportunities uh, and being back in Europe, I think, uh, although we have many advantages, we prefer to play things on the safe side. And I'm afraid this is an era where playing on the safe side uh, will not help you anymore. And so uh, try to be bold. Uh, and maybe the Commission should develop these, these bold pilot lines uh, to create new markets, to create a demand side uh, where industry can fail. Uh, we need to experiment a lot more. I also used to work for uh, the Dutch startup uh, scene, I set up the first startup program. Um, you can see that there is an appetite for that. And I think re relating to the report, it's also signaled that uh, new semiconductor companies uh, in the US that's starting again. Uh, the US is investing in it. Um, in, in Europe, that's only coming bit by bit. Uh, and this is really the moment to, to rethink hey, what, what are the chips of the future? What are the applications of the future? So that should almost be a, one of the, uh, I don't know if the European Commission wants to talk about the great projects, but that should be one of them, I think. Please. Yeah. Got inspired by the uh, mention of the EU-US uh, Tech and Trade Council, which I, I think is a, a very good initiative, but it's still, to me, one of the examples of how we 
have uh, sometimes too closed environments and, and we should broaden it a bit. It's a very, uh, it's a very governmental uh, council. I would like it to be more open and also what I think is important is we include more stakeholders. So academia is, is one thing there where I think if we can actually benefit from some of the, the skills we show uh, that is shown in this report and bring it into to play with the industry, I think that will help also on the semiconductor front that we have a, a closer collaboration between the universities, the, the science, the, the less uh, um, commercial parts of, of Europe. So, so for me, uh, I, I'm a member myself of a Danish uh, technology think tank which is based on academia and I don't see a lot of commercial interest there and I think we need to actually make those come together. We call it lab to fab and there's a big gap sometimes and in the US we're trying to figure that out. It sounds like maybe here there's the same problem. You have great ideas, you never commercialize them, you lose the value. Or vice versa, you, if you commercialize something, then it generates more ideas if you have that close interaction, that close partnership between academia and, um, and industry. Johan, I, I noticed you nodding to, to what you're hearing. This is backed up by the studies you've seen. Yes, yes it is. Um, uh, we're, we're rightfully so talking about resilience. And, and, and that's absolutely true. Uh, but the other key aspect uh, to, to consider, and that's what's b behind lab to fab, as you call it so nicely, is, is the innovative power of, this, of these connections that, uh, that uh, take place. Um, mm -hmm. um, the, the value chain, as we said, of semiconductors is very long and very complex. Um, but most of the innovations is not only done upstream, uh, we should also uh, uh, keep in mind the downstream uh, one. The connections between automotive industries that are figuring out how to do electric cars and make them self-driving, and uh, companies that are heavily involved, like uh, the Intels or TMCs and others of the world, uh, into, into making that. It's that connection, that's where the tension happens, and that's where the value is, uh, is, is built. And that's precisely the reason that Europe cannot afford um, to have zero uh, leading edge uh, manufacturing uh, capacity. We cannot let that uh, go on. It doesn't mean that we will be self-reliant. That, that is a nonsense goal, I think. Um, but it needs to be strengthened. And you need to recognize where, where, the, value is, uh, where the value is created. So that's why I was nodding. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, Nariman Craig, I'm going to put this to you, is asking what else can tech and automotive firms do other than cut cutting production volumes or waiting for semiconductor demands to be met? Uh, is there another economic model? Um, not producing new cars and appliances, but utilizing current ones longer, more shared uses, more collaborations, and the Green Deal. Again, this is actually a, a couple of questions coming in at the moment referencing this Green Deal. Uh, Athaniosis also is asking to the panel generally, is there an alternative solution to overcome the current shortage um, to use devices for more years? And yes, why? Is it greener, but is it also less profitable? Quite a few, quite a few of the audience are asking this question about device use and, and what can in practice help not just overcome the current shortage, but also looking to the kind of the green elements of it and the EU Green Deal. <laughs> Well, maybe I'll kick it off. I, I, you know, <laughs> I know, somebody early on said, I don't know if it was Lise, government can act as a facilitator. And, you know, if, if the CHIPS Act is done correctly, if, it, if it's done quickly and correctly and connects some of these dots that we've talked about, that could be a mechanism to, to facilitate more investment and address the shortage in a, in a meaningful and effective way. It's not going to be addressed short term, unfortunately, right? It has to play itself out a little bit, but there will be other shortages in the future if we don't increase our manufacturing because of the demand. The rise in demand is, is not going away because of the digitization of our economy and so forth. So one of the things that you can take away from our discussion, I think we all said it in different ways, is the need for stronger and better partnerships and connecting the dots and increasing the innovation between manufacturing and design and also other elements of the supply chain. That's where you get the kind of innovation that leads to more more effective or so more pow uh, lower power semiconductors that that produce greener effects, right? That's 
I don't know if anybody else wants to add here. I think up, uh, Joe's thought about really understanding the application and what the technology can do. And if we intertwine it a little bit also, not just with the technology um, it can somewhere deliver, but also the sustainability as aspect behind it, for instance, then you can somewhere also at least address some of these topics. Uh, take an example, a very simple one, uh, cloud data centers are using a lot of renewable energy. Um, now you can ask, okay, you can also use this energy for other applications, but these choices somewhere have to be discussed. Uh, the, the technology options should be somewhere put on the table and developed, and I think there we will develop things which will be innovative and also sustainable. So at the end of the day, innovation will also somewhere contribute very much to sustainability. I think it's not either or, it's really the combination of the two. Thank you. Sigrid, let me ask you the same question. Again, another one has just come in, asking what else could also be done to comply with Green Deal commitments. Does where the chips are located matter? Um, located, I suppose, maybe it means manufactured, but also potentially used. Um, Neriman is asking that. Um, perhaps you could answer with more broadly in terms of what is the relevance to the Green Deal? Um, I think it will become a, a, a very important aspect in competitiveness uh, to include this in uh, the design and manufacturing of semiconductors. Um, looking at energy prices, uh, looking at uh, the energy market, uh, um, that system is also under pressure. Uh, looking at the exponential growth of the digital sector, um, then almost one plus one is two. You need very uh, energy efficient chips uh, to make it still affordable, uh, both in the production as well as the use. I think Europe has a very important uh, position in that. Uh, if you look at the potential of uh, photonics, for, uh, for instance, yeah, so the Green Deal, um, yeah, maybe part of a, a part of the the Chips Act, can also invest in that yeah, to um, invest more in the research, uh, to invest more in the applications. Uh, there's a huge potential also uh, in the U.S. Yeah, I visited many photonics clusters there, so that could be something uh, the U.S. and Europe could work together on. Uh, so uh, my point is, um, this should we be one of the priorities in the future of, of semiconductors, uh, make them energy efficient uh, as possible. Um, yeah, please. Lee, yes, Lise, I was going to bring you in on this question as well. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, the urgency is twofold here. Uh, the shortage, uh, and, and we cannot wait with uh, leading edge semiconductors is important, but the greening is equally important. We've seen with uh, COP26 where everyone is trying to settle a, a good direction for the world. I think Europe has a strong position here. And we as telcos are seeing uh, increased pressure on, of course, what we use ourselves, but also the equipment. And here, I think circular economy is key. We need to know how to reuse, how to use our equipment. And uh, semiconductors, uh, we'll see if they can uh, be replaced with new ones. I, I'm not a technician, but we we all look into a world where the uh, demand is, is growing. Uh, and uh, as, as Secret is saying, it's a competitive advantage, not only for, uh, uh, for the semiconductors, but investors are looking into are we as companies sustainable? So that will rub off on the value chain and, and also, of course, of what kind of semiconductors we're buying. Yo, uh, I, I'm interested to hear, as a, as a more technological background, what your thoughts are on this. I'm, I'm excited we're, we're touching on this because it's, it goes to, uh, to a lot of what we try to do in, in recent uh, um, programs. I mean, uh, this is going to be a shameless commercial, but we, we actually started a program on sustainable systems and technology, which has had uh, quite some global, uh, again, interest in this. And of course, we're not alone. Uh, so if you look from, say, the materials over uh, the production processes, um, the packaging, you know, how you, you um, introduce the chips in, in the 
in the systems that you're you're digitizing, but also of course the reuse. So we're we're trying to look at this from of course a, a fundamental pre-competitive point of view, but try to build the right models and and integrate the the views of of our, uh, our global partners uh, and, and companies into this. So I think that is a very important one. Um, another one is and, and that's touching on the lab to fab uh, to to use type of of uh, chain. Um, you, you, you learn a lot when you, when you go push technology into, for instance, uh, ventures and new startups because they are very directly confronted with their their users, their their customers, and they need to they need to pivot, they need to come out of the box and think different in how their their technology will will change the world eventually. Um, and so that dynamics that that those you know startup and scale up companies have needs to come back into our resilient economy. I think that's an important mindset. But even more importantly, that user-centric view is now changing to a planet-centric view, right? So, I mean, in, in case anything we do um, from, from early research projects to implementation of new technologies, there's going to be this reflex, fortunately, of a plan, planet-centric innovation. And I think that's where the bottom line, our technology, uh, our new SSTS program started, but also it, it, it resonates uh, throughout and, and this will be a, an important wave to um, serve, if, if I can paraphrase this this way. So I think that's a very important element. And along that, I think uh, industry alliances uh, and, and, and again, startups, you know, the, the, new, the new way of doing things, the new way of approaching use cases and, uh, and, and the way we, we go about our lives and our professional uh, um, demeanor is going to be ex extremely important. And I think we need moonshots for that, right? I mean, that's a word that has not uh, dropped yet, but we need to really put a stake in the ground far enough so that we we open our eyes and say, okay, if that's the type of future we are uh, we are going to be needing, uh, we need to really rethink uh, some fundamentals of this. And I, I truly, I'm, I'm totally convinced that our semiconductor technology can help do that. But first thing you need to do is to to look at our own shop and see that we can do the best we can in in that um, in that direction. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, well done for being the first one to use the word moonshot in this debate. Um, we're into our last sort of 15 minutes rounding up. And there's a, a new question. And, and indeed, thank you to our audience, both online and here for submitting all these questions. As we say, there's been a big interest in this sustainability green element. But uh, I have a question here from Frank who's asking, is there an addition, additional hidden bottleneck? brackets IP um, and, and how could this issue be managed um, I'm, I'm going to put this Guido to you and Johan um, is is you know is there is there a, another bottleneck that we haven't been talking about yet today I, th I think IP is an important element especially in this industry um, and um, yeah it's uh, there are a lot of let's say is it built also a lot of on, on, on kind of how we handle IP um, and there must be s I think good systems in place to somewhere ensure that IP is treated in the way that people who generate IP can also benefit from it, but also that you can somewhere share it in, in, in a good way, in a fair way, in an open economy. So I think it's 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 a valuable it's it's a, it's an important topic to create a system and also a governance that allows IP development and also IP sharing uh, on a global basis. Greg, do you think the Europe is moving in the right direction on this? I mean, IP is a global matter, but it also falls under the auspices of uh, of the big Berlimont building next door to us. Well, maybe I could redirect the question to Yo and he listened to, because IMEC has been extremely successful, and maybe he could say something about their IP model. Yo, can you indeed Greg, say something about your IP <laughs> Thank, thanks for the accolades, but I think we actually came out to discover that together, right? I mean, the way to treat this and pre-competitive uh, research, and I'm stepping away from the real university research. We, we have like 700 PhD students working in our programs, so we understand what it means to work together with these, uh, with, with, the, with the universities. But the IP becomes, um, of course, more sensitive if you if you come to the end product. And I think we, we have indeed learned throughout partnerships that... Um, you can you can actually share quite a bit of IP, and if if I can refer to the ITRS, um, which used to be you know in the happy scaling period, uh, just pointing to where the red bricks were and and try to tackle those, then we knew pre-competitive uh, what it meant, right? Of course, consolidation and you know the, the ecosystem did change uh, 
over the past decade or uh, plus, but still there is this pre-competitive need. And IP is only a problem if you can't access it, right? I mean, and, and you need to make sure that there is a way, and that's what we structure in our programs, is that the partners that need to go out and make a difference in the market, they can get access to the IP. Sitting on it does, does never uh, help. Um, of course, there are areas which are very sensitive and we need to, we need to protect competitiveness. And in a sense, we need to make sure that companies that come work with us don't get um, you know, uh, frustrated in that process. They need to make sure that they have a differentiating element. But all of them, from the startups to, to the largest companies, they have their own R&D behind what they do in the shared model. And they can always differentiate based on, on their own insights and, and maybe their business to business collaborations they, they have themselves. So it's a bit of a clumsy answer, uh, Greg. I'm sorry, thanks for referring the question to me, but I think it's very important that we continue, and that is a dynamic landscape. We continue to understand what IP is needed to make an impact and how we can share it um, or, or make sure it is secured. But it's it's something that really is um, is, is in the interplay of the, of the ecosystem and it can be done. I think that's what we indeed have shown over the past uh, decades. Well, well, thank you for tackling that. I think it was it was a, an audience question, but it's important to acknowledge that it is part of the overall ecosystem. Uh, Sigrid, I have a question from Dimitri asking, how profitable is it today for international investors to engage in the EU semiconductors field? Um, I suppose this comes down to questions of investment. Um, perhaps you can talk about that more broadly. Um, yeah, I'm also interested in the, the opinion of uh, the other panel members. Uh, I think it's very profitable. Um, has, starting as what I said earlier, uh, if we look at our mature semiconductor industry, um, uh, who have invested in, in certain niches like automotive and cybersecurity over the last you know, couple of years, decades, um, that's a very competitive sector. Uh, there's a lot of competition going on, uh, but they've always managed to stay ahead and develop their their business uh, globally. Uh, they're also each other's competitors, uh, but I think uh, from that perspective, uh, Europe is definitely worthwhile. Um, if I look at uh, leading edge, um, uh, of course, I mentioned the Dutch company before, uh, uh, who are developing uh, the next generation uh, after EUV, uh, which will be uh, world leading uh, probably again if, if they all succeed and I have all confidence in that. Uh, so there are many building blocks within the European ecosystem uh, that have a lot of meaning and potential so globally. And so I would definitely uh, invest. Uh, if I look at important investment uh, companies in the world, uh, they also have a, a big share in these companies, um, and I think it can only become more. Uh, I have uh, looking at the Chips Act. We we talked about this before. Huh? So now the U.S. and the EU both have a Chips Act, and at the same time, they both are looking into um, how can we make this into a very strong instrument. Um, attracting investment should be part of that. Yeah, we've been talking about public-private, uh, also public-private and planet. Uh, I would add the citizen to that. Um, the more we, via the CHIPS Act, attract these investments, the more we think of a new concept, uh, how to make it sustainable, how to make it energy efficient, and also to make sure that the applications uh, are meaningful to our citizens. It's a topic we didn't touch upon, uh, but citizens want to be involved. Uh, in Europe, we talk about uh, a human-centered approach on tech, and this is a moment to, to do that right. Thank you very much, Sigrid. You've re really got that point, I think, clearly across. Um, Johan, here, I... The, the study is entitled Europe's Urgent Need to Invest in a Leading Semiconductor Ecosystem. Um, invest has many meanings, but I, I guess our audience member is asking, what about the profitability? What about the ROI? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, <laughs> go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Secret already mentioned it, and also I think also you gave a topic there. Uh, first of all, I think the whole industry now I'm talking about mature, advanced, um, and so on um, are very attractive. Just compare a few valuations, so market valuations of uh, let's say more 
historic kind of industries towards the semiconductor industry and take uh, European players, take US players, take Asian players, they're quite highly valued. Okay, currently there's a, uh, the market is very favorable. Nevertheless, I think uh, stock markets are very much valuing semiconductor and that's an indication for growth and profitability in the long term. So um, I think, uh, and, you, and you can do the same thing also for European companies. I think another element which maybe sh would be important, and I don't want to somewhere now twist there the discussion is what Yo mentioned is about the startups and creating um, uh, kind of a new kind of new companies. If you look back 30 years in the U.S., large companies, large players in the industry today, they were startups at the time, and we see that in Europe currently now coming up with digital companies. Uh, just one example, in Germany, there are a few digital companies now in the stock market index. Um, we have several unicorns. It would be great if in Semiconductor we would also develop this um, uh, from a startup or from a company um, into a yeah big kind of <laughs> listed company. I know this is more kind of a vision. It takes a long time. It, there's a long perspective. But nevertheless, it would be great to have maybe new companies there and we also said in our study is um, uh, these can be future customers for some other people in the ecosystems, new customers. Well, <laughs> you've, you've done a great job of setting up for, <laughs> for, for my last question, which is I started by asking about what was the doomsday scenario. I, I want then just a final, uh, a quick one minute. What is the potential? What is your optimism? Johan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in rotation. Johan, what's your optimism? You want me to be optimistic? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, um, I think everything is. I think actually the, uh, the the comment was made. I believe it was Sigrid that the study was timely, uh, and I think it is timely. It's um, certainly coming out. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful now of the pandemic. C can I say that coming out? I'm not sure, um, but anyway, um, certainly after we see what has happened, the enormous importance of of digital in the broader sense of the word in every part of life, in every part of life, is I think becoming clear to absolutely everyone. Uh, that So the urgency, I think, is higher uh, than, uh, than ever. Uh, it does not come cheap. This requires a massive effort, Let, let's be realistic too, and a lot of investments, by both private and government, by the way, both, both. Um, but I believe that the urgency is now higher than ever, and uh, that's the prime reason that I'm optimistic. Please. Yeah, from the telco point of view, I, I think we have uh, a lot of opportunities of if we bring the, uh, the, the semiconductors back to Europe or the leading edge uh, semiconductors. We have uh, the potential of, of course, a strong digital leadership, but we have the skills that can actually be reinforced and multiplied. And, and I also think we have a very tech savvy, both a citizen uh, pool and also governmental pool in, in Europe. So that will be uh, even enhanced and, and get stronger for our citizens. And last but not least, I think if we bring this to Europe and, and have it as a European uh, uh, center of, of uh, innovation, we will have a more human-centric approach like Sigrid is, is uh, talking about. And I think this is the core of our digital future that we have this European uh, approach where we bring the human in the center and see technology from that angle. Greg. <laughs> From an Intel point of view, right? We've announced the desire to invest $20 billion in Europe and with the potential to go up to $100 billion. And we have partnerships with IMEC and Fraunhofer and CA Leti, and we have a number of suppliers here in the ecosystem. And, and just the, we do feel that people are feeling a sense of urgency to act and to, to develop these partnerships and to you know, do it from R&D, pre-competitive R&D, all the way up to applications, as you talked about. So uh, we're very optimistic. I think we're going to see more innovation next decade than we've seen the last 30 or 50 years. Sigrid, your optimistic outlook as a wrap-up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll do my best to think of a nightmare scenario next time. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, this is the momentum uh, to act and to do it right. Uh, I think we uh, mentioned many elements that should be taken into account. Uh, it's a complex decision. 
uh, but it is a decision that should be made. Are we going to invest in leading edge and how are we going to do that? But also the question why, huh? what do we want to accomplish? Not only market value, not only a uh, huh? flourishing economy, not only better partnerships, but definitely also a better planet uh, and a, a human centered approach so that there will stay trust uh, in technology and support uh, for these tremendous opportunities uh, that are there for the next yeah, decades, I think. And finally, Yo, the last word falls to you to define the utopia. <laughs> oh my goodness, last word and utopia in one sentence. Um, so I, I'm optimistic for three reasons, uh, basically. First of all, I think we understand the urgency and we see it supported by a, a broad application view and, and a planet-centric view, as we talked about. That's one. Second, I, I see, as Greg said, the, the industry leaders really eager to to take the opportunity, to take the momentum and understanding where they can play. I see it. Uh, we see it in our, all our partners. We see it in, in Europe specifically as well, and we see it also with our colleagues in the um, in, in the R and D and, and pilot uh, business, like uh, Frau Nofer was mentioned, Sealit was mentioned, and us. You know, we're coming really closely together to take that opportunity. And then thirdly, I see the the political will. Right, I'm optimistic about that. I mean, we've had ways before with with Nelly Cruz, as mentioned by Sealit earlier, and and we see it now. Um, there is understanding that something needs to happen. It, uh, there's uh, transatlantic political discussions on that, as Greg mentioned, and we see uh, are really optimistic there that we can get uh, our, our chips act together, so to speak. Um, so with that, I, I hope it's not utopia. I think it's it's our future. Thank you very much indeed, Joe, for those thoughts. Thank you in, for all our panelists and to you, the audience, uh, both here in the interactive offices and online, for your great questions, for helping to drive this conversation. Um, you can see this report. It is hot off the presses today. There are lots of links online. You'll find it no problem if you go to the various websites. And of course, with that, thank you very much to Intel for organizing today's event. Follow them online as well to find out more about the semiconductor industry and how it's going to build a better future for all of us. And of course, do follow us on your active as we have many other events coming up, partially in person and partially broadcast to the wider world. So with that, have a great day and thanks for your thoughts. <laughs>